Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor at Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen, here is a telephone number. That's the church office. Uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessings. Amen, church. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 13 or grab your journals. The kingdom of heaven is like. I wonder this morning what words you would use to describe the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever been tasked with the responsibility of, of explaining something to somebody without using the, the words that describe that thing? But you have to come up with a way to, to, to verbalize uh, an idea or an experience in a way that, that somebody else will desire it. The kingdom of heaven is like, what words would you use this morning? I would use words like this, uncontainable, unstoppable, costly, priceless, pervasive, and invasive. Are those words that you would use to describe the kingdom of God? You see, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is, is continuing to give us parables of the kingdom. This is incredibly important for this moment in time that, that, that those who are already following him and those who will follow him understand the nature of the kingdom. And perhaps we could even say this morning that it was wrapped up in that last phrase of the, the song we sang. He is worthy of it all. Not just worthy of our, our verbal praise, not just worthy of, of our words, but worthy of our lives. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of, of everything that you and I are and everything that you and I bring. He is worthy of it all. That's the nature of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like. Today, as we walk through Matthew chapter 13, we're going to walk through several sets of parables. Jesus, like he often does, uses, uses pairs to kind of emphasize that which he would have us to know. And as we walk through this passage this morning, I want us to think in a real personal kind of way. If he is worthy of it all, am I bringing my all to him? Am I giving my all? To him, you know, we used to sing a song growing up. It was uh, usually a song of invitation, and it and it and the words went something like this: "All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give." You remember that hymn? I will ever love and trust Him in His presence, faithfully live. I surrender all. And every time we would sing that song, I would think to myself, "Oh God, I wish that were true in my life." There's so many things that I hold on to in my life. If we were to be honest, when we sang a song like that, it would be this. I surrender all but my finances and my kids and my parents and my job and my future and my hobbies. I sur but I surrender all, Lord. If he is worthy of it all, are we bringing him our all? Are we giving him our all? What is the kingdom of heaven like, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read uh, verses 31 through 33, and then we're going to skip to 44 and 52. If you would stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word, you can follow along on the screen or follow along in your scriptures, starting with verse 31. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. A man took it and he sowed it in his field. 
It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Verses 44 through 52. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man covered up after he found it. Then he, in his joy, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, they will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. <laughs> Believe them? <laughs> Have you understood all these things? They said, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Father, as we bow before you this morning in submission, we do so just acknowledging, God, we need your spirit to to teach us, to instruct us. Lord, I'm unworthy to stand before uh, these folks and talk about the kingdom of God and surrendering all. I'm so much in process in my own life, and there's so many things that I hold on to. There's so many areas in my life where I I want to keep your kingdom at arm's distance because because when your kingdom invades that space, something's going to have to change. Oh God, I pray that we would get a glimpse of your kingdom today. God, that we would get a glimpse of your purposes and your plan and and your desire for us as as followers of Jesus or, or those of us maybe in this space today who haven't committed ourselves to following you yet. God, I pray that you speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody ever taken a course on communication? They've probably told you in that course that if you want to get a point across, you have to repeat it at least like eight or ten times, depending on who you talk to, right? You have to repeat it at least eight or ten times. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus repeats the phrase ten times, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. You kind of get the feeling that he's trying his best to help these folks understand what he's saying, right? And like us, or like me, maybe not, I won't speak for you, but, but like me, sometimes I'm a little hard-headed. Sometimes I'm a little slow to maybe get something. And so I appreciate someone who repeats it over and over and over again. Ten times in this passage, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like. That must mean Jesus wants us to remember it. That must mean Jesus wants us to remember it. That must mean Jesus... No, I won't. won't. Jesus spent a lot of time explaining the kingdom of heaven, didn't he? He, he? He explained it over and over again, really for one simple reason. And, and we're not going to throw stones at the original audience because you and I are just like them. He explained the kingdom of God over and over again, the kingdom of heaven over and over again, because the, the people listening to him had a wrong understanding of what the kingdom was. They had a, they had a, a wrong uh, understanding of, of what the rule and reign of God ultimately looked like. We've talked about this before, right? And we know this to be true. The Jews, when Jesus came on the scene, what were they expecting? A conquering king. We're finally going to be done with Rome. And all of a sudden it became very obvious that Jesus came to conquer something, but it wasn't the Roman Empire. It was the heart of man. And when people began to realize that that Jesus came to conquer the heart of man, man's heart became very hard. (laughs) Man's heart became very resistant because because we don't want our hearts to be conquered. We don't want to be submissive to another person. They had an unrealistic expectation of what the kingdom was. 
So he, he spoke in these parables, these, these kingdom parables, so, so that they could get a, a genuine glimpse of what it meant for the kingdom of God to come. And so he uses the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. I don't know, do, do you feel like you and I have an unrealistic view of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? If we find ourselves thinking that, that God is, is, is here to serve us, then we have an unrealistic expectation and understanding of the kingdom of God. If we have the idea that, that everything in this life should go our way, that every, every uh, job that we have is successful and every relationship we have is successful and, and our kids are if we have this idea in our minds that, that, that because we're followers of Jesus, everything should go our way, we probably have an unrealistic expectation of the kingdom of heaven. The rule and reign of God. When you hear the word kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, think this. It is the rule and reign of God. We have an unrealistic view. You know why? Because, because like the original audience, we have a little bit of a what's in it for me mindset. What's in it for me? Oh, I'll follow Jesus, but what's in it for me? I'll, I'll obey Jesus, but what's in it for me? Listen, Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, but there's nothing in it for us this side of eternity other than knowing that we belong to him, that we have the abundant life in Jesus Christ. Things may not go your way. Relationships may break apart. Jobs may not work out. Kids may not turn out the way we hope they do. But that doesn't mean that God has changed. He is still on his throne. There is a rule and reign that moves forward no matter what the circumstances. So Jesus, trying to demonstrate the true nature of the kingdom, trying to demonstrate that, 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 that Jesus is the fulfillment, if you will, of the, the messianic kingdom that was prophesied in the Old Testament, we see it over and over again, right? Who do you say that I am? Jesus, as he comes on the scene, is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. That's why he, Jesus and Matthew both include multiple times references to Isaiah. Because Isaiah points us to Jesus. He is the messianic king. He is the one who has come to rule and reign. Do you remember from the very beginning of Matthew, one of the most common phrases we saw and focused on was this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was talking about Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is hand, at hand. The rule of reign of, and God, of God is now expressed through his son, Jesus, who became flesh and has made his dwelling among us. It, it is the kingdom of heaven is as we've seen in Matthew, that which demands a response. We've talked over and over again throughout these, these weeks as we've gotten through Matthew. There is, there's no neutral ground. There's no middle ground response to the kingdom of God, is there? Either in or you're out. You don't, you don't dabble in the kingdom. You don't, you don't pretend. You're either in or you're out. It demands a response. And from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he made sure that, that, that the people understood that. I mean, this is the very kingdom, the rule and reign of God that we are to pray for in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What are we asking for? What are we asking for? We're asking for the rule and reign of God to come right here, right here, to come right here just as it is in heaven, perfected. We're asking for the rule and reign of God, but... but the kingdom parables remind us that the kingdom of God may not be what we expect it to be. And it's certainly not going to be, at times, what we want it to be. Because it's going to collide with our selfishness. It's going to collide with our agenda. It's going to collide with our wants and our desires. And we're going to have to decide, is he king or am I? And ultimately, as, as he tells this kingdom, these kingdom parables and we see those who got it and those who did it and we tried to help, help us understand why some people got it and one, some people didn't. And we've even looked down the road. Last week as David preached, we've looked down the road 
there will be at the end of the age a separation of those who, who, who got it and those who didn't, those who submitted to Christ and those who refused to submit to Christ. Thy kingdom come. So to help his disciples and to help us understand what the kingdom is like, he gives us parables. I was trying to think this week. I was like, what could I try to describe to people that would, one, make them like be amazed at it, and two, help them make them desire it? And the only thing that came to my mind was it was a sunny Saturday morning in Topeka, Kansas. My girlfriend and I were uh, out and about trying to figure out what we were going to do for the day. And we realized that there was a balloon festival happening that day. Much like we have down at, in Colorado Springs, except a little smaller. So we said, hey, let's drive down to the balloon festival. We'll hang out at the balloon festival. So we did. We drove down the balloon festival and we're walking around. And, and we come up on a group of people and, and, and we're both looking at these people. And I said, those people look familiar. And she goes, yeah, they all go to our church. And I'm like, what are they doing here? We'll come to find out. Somebody in our church had a balloon. So we go up to our people from our church, and we get to talking to them and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and, they're, and, and they're taking off and landing. Taking off. It starts out in this really, really big field. And, and, and the guy who owns the balloon says to us, hey, do you guys want to chase the balloon with us today? I'm like, I have no idea what that means, but I'm in. And then after I said that, my girlfriend says to me, do you think he means on foot? I'm like, I hope not. <laughs> so he takes off and, and the people on the ground say, okay, everybody get in their cars and we'll, we'll just kind of follow him. We don't have a map. We don't know which way he's going to go. We'll just follow him. All right, here we go. So we follow him to the first, the first spot and we see him come down. And so we find a place to park and we, we run over and we have to grab the tethers on the balloon. And the guy in the balloon, the guy who owns the balloon, says, says to me and my girlfriend, he goes, have you ever been up in a balloon? I've never been up in a balloon. What's it like? He goes, well, I can't describe it. You just got to experience it. You want to go? Yeah, we want to go. So we jump into the balloon. And it's like this. It's like, I don't know if you've ever been um, to uh, like Air 360, Air City 360, one of those indoor trampoline parks where you run and you, you jump on these little springboard things and all of a sudden you just kind of feel like you're floating until you don't, right? <laughs> we stepped in this thing and he took off and all of a sudden there was this, this, this quiet, shh, shh, and we begin to float and we begin to, to, to move higher and higher and I'm, I'm looking over the side going, is this really happening? And we float over part of the city of Topeka. And I'm, and I'm thinking the whole time, I, I don't know how I'm going to describe this because I asked the guy who owned the balloon, I said, what's it like? He goes, I can't describe it. You just got to feel it. You got to experience it. So here we are in this balloon. We're, we're floating. It's like, it's like we're flying. I mean, this, this little basket and, and, and the breeze in our face, you can't, there's, there's hardly any noise anywhere. And you're just floating over the city. And then you begin to come down and you think, this is going to hurt. <laughs> this is going to be a hard landing. Because the first time he came down, when we grabbed the little tether, we didn't know what we were doing. And so it bounced like four or five times. But this time it came down and everybody kind of figured it out. And they, they grabbed the tethers and, and we just landed like we were putting our head on a pillow. The rest of the day, you could not wipe the smile from my face. I mean, we were giddy. It was, it was an experience like none other. I've, I've never had an experience equal to it. And I can't even describe it, but, but if I were to use words like the, the hot air balloon is like jumping off a springboard and floating through the sky. It's like having a, a bird's eye view in this, in this quiet space where, where there's hardly any noise and and you just have a view of God's creation, which is also known as Topeka, Kansas. Can I get an amen? <laughs> it's hard to describe unless you've experienced it. And that's what Jesus does in these kingdom parables. He, he, he describes what they are. He gives us a, a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven is like and then invites us to experience it. 
Many will, but most won't. Most won't. There will be a response of, of rejection, not submission. There will be a response of, of fear, not of desire and longing. So we come to these pairs of parables as we see in Matthew chapter 13. And in the first pair, the mustard seed and the leaven, or the, the yeast, we see two words. The first is invasive. The kingdom of heaven is invasive. Already you have images in your word of that, or your mind of that word, don't you? The word invasive is not necessarily a, 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 a positive kind of word. Matter of fact, as Jesus goes through these kingdom parables, he actually draws a lot, of, a, a lot of words that have negative connotations because it flips the script for the hearers of that day. We use the word invasive when we're going to get a colonoscopy, right? It's not something that we, we necessarily delight in. And here we are talking about the kingdom of heaven is invasive. What do we mean? Well, look at Matthew chapter 13. Verse 31, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. And a man took it and sowed it in a field. It's the smallest of the seeds, but when it grew, it became larger than any other plants in the garden. And it became so large that birds of the air can make a nest in it. Do you know what the original hearers would have thought of when they heard the word mustard seed? They would have said, no, thank you. No, thank you, because mustard seed, I don't know what it compares to like modern day. I was trying to think of it, but, but when you plant a mustard seed in your garden, it takes over the garden. It destroys the soil around it. It consumes all the resources. It's actually not a beautiful plant. He, Jesus kind of uses the word tree and, and, and birds coming in it, which also paints a, a negative picture in the minds of the hearers because the last thing they want in their gardens, garden is birds, right? Because birds eat things in the garden. So he says, he says it's, like a, it's like a mustard seed. And all of a sudden, the, the, the hearers would be like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean, a mustard seed? That, that's a, that's a, a noxious weed. It grows and it spreads and it, and it negatively impacts everything around us. Now, was Jesus saying the kingdom of heaven is going to negatively impact your life? No. But once it takes hold, once it takes hold, it changes everything. Once the, the kingdom of God hits, hits the soil of your life, hits the garden of your life, everything will be touched by it. It's invasive. It, it, it spreads. It, it consumes. You still want to be in the kingdom? That means it's going to find you right where you are. And it's going to point out the attitudes of my heart and the attitudes of your heart and the sins in our lives. And it's going to, it's going to invade the private spaces that, that no one would even think to know about in our lives. The kingdom of heaven is invasive. But it's also pervasive. The yeast, the leaven. Now, we're not talking about the red star packet of dry active yeast right here, okay? We're talking more like a sourdough starter. My wife recently decided she wanted to try a sourdough starter. I don't think it's going very well. I don't know what to judge it by. All I know is you have to feed it. I don't even know what that means. You feed it. It's a jar of goo. And you take half of it out and you feed it. More flour and water. I'm like, why are we throwing flour away? We could be making bread. No, we got a sourdough starter. It's a little bit more like this. That's sidetracked. Don't get that image in your mind. Oh, it's already there. It's pervasive. It's, it's a simple phrase. I mean, we don't even get, he didn't even get very much billing. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Leaven. And once it's put in these three measures of flour, until it was all leavened, until it was pervasive, it went through all the flour. <laughs> Sourdough starter. It's a leftover lump of fermented dough. But once it begins to grow, it touches everything. That's why these two are a pair. <laughs> we see the mustard seed as it, as it begins to take root. It, it begins to consume everything around it. Yeast, 
You can't even see it at work, really. It just kind of starts, right? You don't even know what's happening. And the next thing you know, you have this, woo, this big old loaf of bread or whatever. What's interesting is, up to this point, yeast, again, had been a very negative con uh, condon condon condonation, right? <laughs> Easy for me to say, least. Yeast, leaven, right? Matter of fact, he even refers to the Pharisees. He refers to the Pharisees. He says their hypocrisy is like yeast. It's, it starts small, but it, but it consumes everything. Matter of fact, back in the day in the Passover, in order to celebrate the Passover, they had, they had to get all the yeast out of their home. They had, to, they had to get rid of it all. And part of it was because they, when they left, they didn't have time to, to make a few sandwiches, right? All they knew is they were being delivered by the hand of God, and God wanted them to know that he would provide. So they got rid of all the yeast, the, the very thing that, that would produce these multiple loaves of bread. Pervasive. The Jews were to totally eliminate it because they wanted, he wanted them to be reminded of what he has done. Yeast is hard to handle. Anybody ever um, taken, uh, speaking of those little red, star active yeast packets. Has anybody ever mixed in a little yeast and thought, oh, I was hoping to make unleavened bread. I'm going to take the yeast out. <laughs> you, you can't take the yeast out, can you? Once it, once it begins to do what yeast does, and I'm not all that smart on what yeast does, obviously, but apparently it does what it does. And it, and it moves and it penetrates and it is pervasive in that everything is influenced by that yeast. Do you get the picture of the kingdom he's trying to make? This is not the kingdom that maybe you were looking for. This is not the kingdom that you expected. It's invasive. It's pervasive. It's not just another thing in your life. It is the thing in your life. It is it's not something else you've got to give some time and energy to. It is the thing that, that, that should consume you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? Pervasive. And invasive starts small and it grows exponentially. But once it takes hold, once it takes hold, it transforms everything it touches. Listen, when you choose to plant the kingdom of heaven in your life, in the garden of your life, you can never be the same. Because you've come to the place where you recognize that, that it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. And that means he gets his way. When the kingdom is established in your heart, the rule and reign of God, that means the rule and reign of God is over everything in your life. Every decision you make, teenager, is under the rule and reign of God if you're a follower of Jesus. Adults, every decision that we make, every attitude that we have, every act of forgiveness or unforgiveness, it's all under the rule and reign of God, right? We don't pick and choose and say, okay, I want this to be under God's rule and reign because that's a good place for it to be, but I, but I want to keep this kind of under my rule and reign. It doesn't work like that. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the rule and reign of God is invasive and pervasive. The second pair, starting in verse 41 is costly and priceless. There's a treasure found in the field, the Bible says, verse 44. It's hidden in a field, and a man finds it, covers it up, and then in his joy goes and sells all that he has to buy the field. Now, I'm not sure what's going on with this guy. I don't know why he's in somebody else's field with a metal detector. I'm not sure what the, the whole thing is with that, but that is not the point of this here parable, all right? So if you're like me and you kind of get stuck right there for a minute, you're just going to have to let it go. We do not know what the guy was doing in somebody else's field. He could have been digging out a tree stump for all we know. <laughs> Treasure! I don't know. We don't know what he was doing. All we know that when he found this treasure, he did everything he could to obtain it, to keep it. He, he hid it so no one else would see it. And he went and he sold everything he had in order to go buy that field. Now, if you're just sitting around one day and somebody comes up and says, hey, I kind of want to buy your field. Why? It's not for sale. Oh, I can't really tell you, but I just want to buy your field. Get suspicious. Like if somebody offers you something, they may have found something in your house. All of a sudden they want to buy your home today. 
I'm just telling you, I'm going to be a little more suspicious from now on. The point is this. The kingdom is often discovered in unexpected and unexplained places. The kingdom of heaven, it's maybe one of those things in your life. And maybe some of your testimonies, even here this morning, some of your testimonies were, man, I wasn't walking with God. I didn't want to walk with God. I didn't want to know God. I didn't, I didn't want anything to do with God. And all of a sudden, your life intersected the gospel, and you've never been the same. Because you stumbled on the treasure. You stumbled on Jesus. He, he met you where you were, and he redeemed your life. And you have been forever changed. I'm guessing that's many of our stories today. The kingdom of heaven is, 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 is costly. It's costly. Now, he says this, with great joy. By the way, I don't know if you've ever been, excuse me. <laughs> sound like I'm, <clears throat> my voice is changing. I don't know if you've ever been around a church where you're not quite sure people even know how to spell the word joy. Like, put it this way. When I was a music pastor Brother Bonnie, you probably the same. You probably did the same thing. There's probably a moment where you stood up and, and you're like, okay, listen, if we're going to sing about the joy of the Lord, you're going to have to let your face know it. <laughs> yeah, you've been there? We walk around like we've just sucked on a, a sour lollipop or something, right? I mean, with joy. That's one aspect of the, the kingdom. It's something received with joy. It's not a burden. It's a blessing. It's something that we look at and we think, there's nothing like it. And I don't want anything else beside it. So with joy, he went and sold everything. I don't know what everything meant for him. I don't know what that included. I don't know if he had to sell his Model T Ford. I don't know what he had to sell. But he went and sold everything in order to purchase that field. You see how the kingdom is a little pervasive and invasive, right? I mean, you can't, you can't shake it. You don't want to walk away from it. Jesus paints this picture of, of this treasure found in a field that is worth it all. The kingdom of heaven is also primarily costly because of what it cost God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Bonhoeffer, I love how he, how he writes about cheap grace. Yes, grace is absolutely free. You and I don't merit it. You and I don't deserve it. It is absolutely free, but that doesn't mean it's cheap. That doesn't mean it doesn't have demands on our life. You see, the kingdom wasn't coming for the convenience of man. The kingdom was coming for the glory of God. And when you and I understand that, we operate differently in response to the kingdom. If it's about you and it's about me, we'll live a completely different than if it's about him, right? It's free, but it's not cheap. The second pair in this parable is priceless. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Now we get this picture that, that this guy is an expert pearl finder. Um, from what I understand, pearls are hidden in clams, right? Is that right? Oysters. Yeah. This, this doesn't sound like a fun task to me. I mean, do you, think he, do you think you stumble on a pearl that's outside of an oyster? I don't know. I, I, anybody, any, any pearl finders in the place? I'm really kind of, I'm really kind of perplexed by this one because this just doesn't seem like a fun job. But the guy had a job. He's finding pearls. But he knew what he was looking for. And it wasn't just any pearl. It just wasn't a pearl that would do. It was a pearl of great price, a pearl of great value. What did he do when he found it? He went and sold everything he had. Because he understood that it's priceless. And, and he probably understood that everything that he had and everything that he sold really wasn't even enough to purchase this pearl because it was of such great value. Now, I did think as I was just processing through this parable in my own mind and my own heart, how often, how often it could be said of us that we're on a, a pearl hunt. We're looking for something in this life of great value, something with meaning, but we don't have necessarily the same intention this pearl hunter had. We'll just settle for any old thing that seems meaningful. <laughs> 
We weren't made for settling for any old thing that was meaningful. We were made for a relationship with the Father through his son, Jesus. And, and when you find that, that pearl of great price, you come to the recognition is, recognition is priceless. And you're going to do whatever it takes to have it. That's how the kingdom of heaven is like. Jim Elliott, you've heard me probably quote this. You've probably quoted it yourself. Um, a, a, a missionary who died trying to take the gospel to a remote Indian village says this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 6, didn't he? Don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth where, where moth and rust destroy. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. You see, the, the, the kingdom, when it comes, it, it reminds us that this is not our home, that this is not our stuff, that this is not what I'm pursuing. I'm to pursue the king and his kingdom because it is priceless. Priceless. As Jesus always does, he calls for a response. Matter of fact, the parables of the kingdom by nature are calls of response. It's impossible to, to intersect these parables in our lives and, and, and leave unaffected, unimpacted, unchanged. So he points out in these final two kingdoms, or these final two parables, the reality of the kingdom of heaven. It's received with joy. It's it's worth giving everything for. But there's going to be some who receive it and many who reject it. I don't know how many times we've had this theme throughout our, our study of Matthew. The, the distinction between those who have received it and those who have rejected it. We've been reminded, as, again, as David preached so powerfully last week, that there is coming a day when, when the wheat and the tare will be separated. He uses a, a, a similar parable in the parable of the net, catches all the fish, doesn't bother picking the good or bad out. He brings the whole haul in and then sorts out the good from the bad. So, so we know that there's a day coming when you and I stand before God and, and we give an account with our response to Jesus. Who do we say that he is? Who do you say that he is? Have you allowed the kingdom to come in your heart and in your life? For those who have, the kingdom is turning your world upside down and mine. <laughs> For those who haven't, the kingdom of heaven is all gibberish. What are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about living with kingdom priorities? But if you've submitted to the kingdom, you've said yes to his rule and his reign. So the third prayer, unstoppable and uncontainable. Unstoppable and uncontainable. It's unstoppable. So you see, he he throws this net into the water in verse 47. It's like a, a net thrown into the sea where it gathers fish of all kind. Listen, the kingdom of heaven is for anyone who will come. For God so loved the world, he throws the net. He longs to be in a relationship with each and every one of us. So he brings us in, and, he, and as he, and he brings us in, there's, there's this response to, to his, his catching us, his pursuing us, his, his act of grace and mercy in our lives. And for those who accept him, they're put in a container. Those who do not, the Bible says in verse 50, They'll be thrown into the fiery furnace in the place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those who ignored Christ's kingdom, who refused to bend a knee, will be thrown into a fiery furnace. I don't know if you're still chewing on what Pastor David said last week or not, but, but folks, there is, a, there is a reality in the scriptures that, that we have to come to grips with. And that is that God has loved everybody and he has extended his salvation to anybody and everybody who will receive it. But for those who do not, there will come a day, a day of judgment where they will be separated and they will be, they'll find themselves in a place of of torment, separated from a holy God. It's unstoppable. The kingdom of heaven, it sweeps over us and it's sweeping over us even now. Listen, that's why we as a church talk about uh, being on mission. 
That's why we talk about going into all the world and making disciples. The kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. God has thrown his net. He's invited people to come. And you and I have the opportunity to be fishers of men and to join him in bringing in the harvest. It's unstoppable. And lastly, it's uncontainable. The master of the house. He said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven. Every scribe that has been, every, every person that's been impacted by the kingdom of heaven. Every person who, who understands the things of God and, and is submitted to the things of God. Will be like a master of the house who brings out treasure. This is where the reproduction takes place. The, the kingdom of God is uncontainable in that when you and I intersect it in our lives, we can't help but declare it to the lives of others. When you and I are transformed and being transformed by the kingdom, we're being turned upside down. The, the mustard seed has been planted. The kingdom is planted in our garden and everything has changed. And everything is changing. It begins to become uncontainable. So the kingdom of heaven is the invasive, pervasive, priceless, costly, unstoppable, uncontainable rule and reign of God. That's what, he's, that's what he wants us to see in these parables. The kingdom of heaven is the invasive, pervasive, priceless, costly, unstoppable, uncontainable rule and reign of God. But perhaps this morning you are asking yourself the question, what does that have to do with you and me? What does it have to do with us? Well, if the kingdom of heaven is the invasive, pervasive, priceless, costly, unstoppable, uncontainable rule and reign of God, then answer this question. Does he rule and reign in you? Does he rule and reign in you? Not, not does he have a seat in the passenger seat. And every once in a while you consult him if you have a decision to make or if you feel like you're going in the wrong direction and you need a little court. Hey, hey. Hey, Jesus, could you just help me out? Hey, I think I maybe took a wrong turn. No, no, Jesus is not in the right seat. He's the left seat guy. <laughs> he, he, is the, he is the captain. He is the, the Lord, the kingdom of heaven. Does he have rule and reign in your life? If the answer is yes, your life looks radically different than it would if he was not. It has to. There's no way we can intersect the kingdom of God and, and be the same. Jonathan Edwards, I'll close with this. Jonathan Edwards, an 18th century pastor, says the nature of humans is to be inactive unless influenced by some affection. Now, that affection could be positive or negative, but our tendency is to remain inactive until, until influenced by some affection. It could be love, hate, desire, hope, fear. He goes on to say that these, are the, these affections are the springs of action. They move us from where we are to a completely different place. In Matthew 13, we see the result of those who are influenced by an affection for the kingdom. Matter of fact, we see two groups of people that were affected, right? We see a group that responded with fear. They responded with, responded with hate. They didn't want anything to do with the kingdom of God. If I, if I have to live according to your kingdom, then I can't live according to mine. And they didn't want any part of it. Perhaps there's some of us here this morning right there. We want our kingdom. We want to be the king. <laughs> we want to be the queen of our life. We don't want to submit to another, but we also see many who, who did respond. And that's where Jesus talks about all these soils and the good soil and the bad soil and the wheat and the tares. It's all a picture of, of response to the kingdom of God. What is the affection in your heart towards the kingdom of God? Is it one of, of love, hope, desire, longing? Oh, I want the kingdom of God. You pray daily, Father in heaven, let your kingdom come, your rule and reign come in my life today. And it may, may it show up in the way I study at school. And may it show up in the way that I interact with my coworkers. And it may, may it show up with the way I love my wives and my wives, my wife and my kids. <laughs> For many, it became a springboard into submission. 
A joyful receiving of the treasure of Christ. Finding something worth losing everything for. Good soil that produced fruit. A life of sacrifice and denial for the kingdom and the king. Church, this has much to do with you and me. We're on a journey. We're in a process. We've not received the fullness of the kingdom. We are, we are kingdom receivers. We are walking in the kingdom of God. We're learning of the kingdom of God. We're learning to treasure the rule and reign of God in lives and in every area of our life. Or we're not. We've stiff-armed the kingdom and said, not today. Not today. I don't want your rule and reign in my life. I want to call the shots. <laughs> There is a great reward in submitting to the redemptive rule of God in Christ. But hear this. There is also a great cost in rejecting the redemptive rule of God in Christ. There's great reward. And many of us are, are, are experiencing that, not in a perfect way, but, but we're working it out. We understand that, that, that we are being sanctified. Even now, we're becoming more like Jesus. We, we, we daily, the best we know how, submit to the kingdom and say, Yes, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. But there's a great cost in rejecting the redemptive rule of God in Christ. And my fear is that some maybe in this place today are actively doing that. There's some people in our lives that are actively doing that. Has your life been impacted and turned upside down by the kingdom? It really is, at the end of the day, a yes or no question. <laughs> Has my life been impacted by the kingdom of God? Paul, in, in, in his testimony, says, I once was dead, but now I'm alive. Is that true of you? Were, were you once dead spiritually, separated from God because of, of your sin? But hallelujah, in Christ you have been made alive. Your sin has been forgiven. You've been redeemed. You've crossed from death to life. That means that you and I are in the kingdom, if that is true. Is that true of you? Are you going to treasure the king and kingdom above all, and his kingdom above all? Or are you going to treasure your kingship and your kingdom above all? Let's pray. God, in a, in a fresh way today, I, I submit to you, to your kingdom. Lord, I want to treasure your kingdom above all, your rule, your reign, the invasive, pervasive, priceless, costly, unstoppable, uncontainable kingdom. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you. Lord, help us to be a, a church of kingdom people who, who show up day in and day out, with a posture of submission to you, your kingdom, your rule, your reign. God, thank you for, for going to extra efforts to help us know what the kingdom of God is like. <laughs> help us to continue to allow your spirit to show us, to reveal to us the beauty of the kingdom, the true nature of the kingdom that we may treasure it above all. God, for those here this morning who have not submitted to your kingdom, have not submitted to your rule and reign, God, I pray you remove any fear from their hearts, even in this moment. Lord, I pray that they would let go of that chair back in front of them and, and they would move towards you, to know you, Maybe for the very first time, God, today someone will, will come into the kingdom because they recognize it is everything that you said it, it is. So we commit these moments to you of response and ask you just to be faithful to move in our hearts and help us to respond accordingly. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand together, I would just close with this question. Does he rule and reign your life? If not, why not? If not today, when? Would you respond as we sing this morning? If you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Christ, we're here for you. We want to help you know Jesus personally. So would you come? We'll gladly talk you through that. Let's sing together.